Inanna, a beautiful goddess whose name and influence has transcended both space and time. She was a goddess of irresistible allure, a goddess that controlled your emotions, both good and bad, love and anger. She is perhaps the most popular goddess in all of Mesopotamian mythology. She is also known as Ishtar in some texts, but their names have been used interchangeably across the Mesopotamian cultures. Inanna stands as a beacon of divine power and complexity. She is the embodiment of the contrasting forces of love and war, fertility and beauty. Her very presence weaved through the lives of gods and mortals alike, a force of nature unmatched in her influence and might. Let us explore the life of a goddess whose influence transcended the physical, affecting one's very heart and soul. This is the story of Inanna, the goddess of love and war, and the queen of heaven and earth. Her story begins in a time when the world was still young, when the sun itself had yet to come into existence. It was a time of perpetual twilight, where the gods worked endlessly to shape the world into what it is today. Amongst the gods, Nana, the god of the moon, and Ningal, the goddess of reeds, found in each other a bond that would forever change the cosmos. Their union led to the birth of three of the most important deities within the Mesopotamian pantheon. First came Ereshkigal, the goddess of the dead and queen of the underworld. Next came the divine twins, Utu, the god of the sun and justice, and Inanna, the goddess of love and war. With the birth of Ereshkigal, the untouched caverns beneath the earth found a new purpose. With great devotion, she constructed the underworld, a place where the soul of the dead would reside. With the birth of Utu, the creation of the world began to truly take root. His rays of sunlight helped foster the growth of all the plants, trees, and vegetation on earth. And with the birth of Inanna, the hearts of all living things, mortal and divine, experienced an array of different emotions. She controlled the love one experienced, fostered bonds and relationships, but also the anger leading to conflict and war. While her siblings and other gods all possessed static roles and specified domains for their power, Inanna was quite different. Because of this, Inanna voiced her discontent to Enki, the god of wisdom. She complained that all the other gods had a place to rule except for her and that she was being treated unfairly. Enki, the wise god, simply told her that she already had her own domain to rule, she just didn't see it yet, implying that the aspects of love and war themselves were more than enough. This response did not sit well with Inanna, and would go on to affect the choices Inanna made throughout her life. Inanna, a goddess who defies simplicity, embodies the essence of both love and war, beauty and destruction. While initially worshipped in the city of Uruk, her influence soon spread across all of Mesopotamia and even into neighboring cultures. Imagine a goddess whose very presence is a dance of contrasts, where the allure of love and the fierceness of battle converge. She was depicted as a beautiful goddess with wings that matched her elegant appearance. With her dual nature of love and war, Inanna was either clad in armor, armed and ready for battle, highlighting her warrior aspect or she would be dressed in a graceful manner, emphasizing her beauty and sensuality, underscoring her role as a goddess of love. More than just the goddess of love and war, Inanna was also considered the goddess of fertility, beauty, sex, divine law, and political power. While fertility, beauty, and sex can all be considered different aspects of love, her association with divine law and political power came much later on, after her adventures with her brother Utu and her rise as the Queen of Heaven. But more on that later. Inanna also possessed the Rod of Power, a scepter that she would constantly carry with her. This scepter represented her ability to measure and judge, integral to Inanna's multifaceted nature. While at first glance Inanna may appear as an elegant and graceful deity, that couldn't be further from the truth. In reality, Inanna was young and impulsive, and often ruled by her emotions. Inanna is often depicted as highly ambitious, seeking to expand her influence and power. This is evident in myths, where she acquires the Mez from Enki, which are divine decrees that symbolize all aspects of civilization, 
indicating her desire to rule and guide humanity. Her role as a goddess of love and sexual desire showcases her passionate nature. Inanna's myths frequently highlight her romantic endeavors and her deep emotions, whether in love or wrath. As a warrior goddess, Inanna represented not only physical battles, but also the protection of her followers and cities. She is depicted as fearless in the face of enemies, showcasing her strength, determination, resilience, and ability to adapt to change. Inanna embodies the full spectrum of human emotions and experiences, from love and compassion to rage and vengeance. This duality is a central theme in her myths, reflecting the complexities of her character. While she can be compassionate and forgiving, she also does not hesitate to exact revenge on those who wrong her or break their oaths to her. Inanna is also portrayed as intelligent and cunning, capable of devising strategies to overcome obstacles and adversaries. Her acquisition of the Mez and her journey to the underworld demonstrate her calculated and strategic thinking. Tales of her emotional decisions often led to death, war, destruction, and punishment, outcomes often depicted in the myths involving Inanna. Inanna's family and relationships reflect the interconnectedness of Mesopotamian mythology. As mentioned before, being born to Nana, the moon god, and Ningal, a goddess of reeds, Inanna is connected to a family of major deities whose influence, roles, and powers affect every aspect of everyday life. Nana, the luminous moon god, sails across the night sky in a celestial boat, casting a silver light over the land. As the father of Inanna, he bestows upon her the mystery and allure of the night, guiding her with the wisdom of the ages. Nana's gentle glow illuminates the paths of travelers and whispers secrets to those who dare to listen in the stillness of the night. His domain over time and its cycles marks the passage of days, months, and years, embedding within Inanna a sense of eternity and change. Ningal, the reed goddess, was felt in the marshes and waterways of Mesopotamia, her voice a soothing melody that speaks of the nurturing essence of life. As Inanna's mother, Ningal, wraps her daughter in the tender care of the earth, instilling in her a connection to growth, fertility, and the foundational elements that sustain existence. The reeds, standing tall and resilient, symbolize the strength and flexibility that Inanna embodies, able to bend with the winds of fate without breaking. Utu, the sun god and brother of Inanna, rides his fiery chariot across the sky, heralding the dawn and bringing light to banish the shadows. With rays that pierce the darkness, Utu is the guardian of justice, his illumination revealing truths hidden in the darkness. His relationship with Inanna is one of mutual respect and collaboration, their powers combined guiding and protecting the people of Mesopotamia. Utu's unwavering path across the heavens inspires Inanna with the virtues of reliability, consistency, and the bright courage to face the unknown. Ereshkigal, queen of the underworld, and Inanna's sister, rules over the realm of the dead, a domain of shadows and silence far removed from the vibrant life of the earth and sky. Her kingdom is one of mystery, where the secrets of death and rebirth are closely guarded. The relationship between Inanna and Ereshkigal is complex, marked by rivalry and confrontation, yet also by a deep, unspoken bond. Their interactions reveal the dualities of existence, the relationship of light and dark, life and death, and the transformative journey of the soul. In addition to her parents and siblings was her two husbands of opposite nature, as well as her many unnamed lovers. Dumuzid, the god of shepherds, agriculture, and fertility, represents the tender and nurturing aspects of love that Inanna embodies. With a heart as vast as the fields he watches over, Dumuzid's union with Inanna is one of poetic beauty, their love story resonating through the ages as a symbol of the eternal cycle of growth and decay, life and death. He brings to Inanna the simplicity of pastoral life, the sweetness of the milk, and the richness of the fleece, enveloping her in the comforts of the earth. Yet their love is not without its trials. The story of Inanna's descent into the underworld leads to Dumuzid's unexpected punishment, reflected in the agricultural cycles of sowing and harvest. More on that later. Zababa, the warrior god and a god of war in his own right, 
is often regarded as similar to Ninurta, the god of war, and Nurgle, the god of death. While their responsibilities may overlap, Zababa's domain as a guardian was primarily within the city of Kish. His union with Inanna was a clash of steel and strategy. In the clash of armies and the racket of battle, Zababa stood by Inanna, his strength complementing her ferocity. Together they are the protectors of cities, the bringers of victory and the dispensers of justice. Though Inanna had two husbands, there are limited surviving texts that talk about her having any children. There is speculation that Nanaya, a goddess of love, is Inanna's daughter, but the sources supporting that claim are limited. Inanna's relationships extended beyond the divine, entering the realm of the mortals. She was seen as having a strong connection to the kings of Mesopotamia, supporting them in their rule and bestowing upon them her favor. One of the kings that had a connection with Inanna was the Sargon of Akkad, a mortal of unmatched ambition and prowess. He rose from the depths of obscurity to forge an empire under the watchful eyes of the gods. His relationship with Inanna was one of power and politics, a divine endorsement that elevated him above mere mortals. Sargon, the great king, brought to Inanna the spoils of his conquests and the loyalty of his subjects, his love for her manifesting in the temples built in her honor and the lands laid at her feet. The Sargon's daughter, Enhedwana, is credited for the widespread popularity of Inanna through her works and poems about the goddess. However, the most important individual in Inanna's life was that of her attendant, Ninshuber. She stood as a figure of unwavering loyalty and resourcefulness in the pantheon of Mesopotamian deities. This divine attendant played a pivotal role in Inanna's mythology, executing her duties with a blend of wit and bravery that underscored her indispensable position. Whether navigating the complexities of politics or supporting Inanna's personal ventures, Ninshubur's actions were crucial to the success of the goddess's endeavors. In the tales of ancient Mesopotamia, Ninshubur was not merely a subordinate, but a trusted ally who could navigate the treacherous waters of divine challenges. Her loyalty was most vividly depicted in the saga of Inanna's descent into the underworld, where Ninshubur rescues the goddess from the wrath of Erishkigal. Ninshubur's portrayal in these myths illuminates the themes of loyalty, intelligence, and the strength found in unwavering friendship. Her character provides a glimpse into the value placed on these virtues within the ancient Mesopotamian worldview, highlighting the importance of allies in achieving divine and mortal goals. The stories and myths involving Inanna are vast, as she is perhaps the deity with the most surviving texts and stories. Given the sheer number of tales, I will do my best to include as many as possible without unnecessary details. Now that we have a grasp on who Inanna was, let's dive deep into the stories that shaped Inanna into the Queen of Heaven and Earth. Inanna and the Hulupu Tree In the early days when Inanna was not yet stable in her powers, she came across a Hulupu tree growing on the banks of the Euphrates River. The tree was a beautiful sight, and Inanna wished to have this very tree moved to her garden in Uruk. She wanted to protect the tree until it was fully grown so that she could carve it into an elegant throne. With ease, Inanna transferred the tree, nurturing it day after day until it had matured. However, a serpent, the Anzu bird and Lilitu, the primordial she-demon, took up residence in the tree. Inanna demanded that the trespassers leave immediately, but her words fell on deaf ears. Despite being a goddess in her own right, she had yet to learn the full capabilities of her power. Her anger and demands soon turned into cries of sorrow. It is then that the hero Gilgamesh, who is for some reason depicted as Inanna's brother, emerges, ready to vanquish these unwanted guests. With a swing of his sword, Gilgamesh slayed the serpent, causing the Anzu bird and Lilitu to flee the tree. Gilgamesh then calls upon his companions, who then assist him in chopping down the Hulupu tree. From the wood, they crafted a bed and throne for Inanna, symbols of her sovereignty and the renewal of her power. Thankful, Inanna crafted a set of drums and drumsticks and gifted them to Gilgamesh as a reward and a token of her gratitude. 
Inanna and Utu. Inanna and Utu share a bond that transcends the typical sibling relationship, deeply rooted in mutual respect and divine duties. Utu, the sun god, not only brings light to the world, but also embodies justice, a principle both deities ardently support. Their collaboration is highlighted in tales where Inanna seeks Utu's assistance, whether for guidance on her numerous adventures or for support in her quest for justice and retribution against those who wrong her. One poignant story involves Inanna turning to Utu for help to enter the underworld, seeking knowledge, and to extend the reach of her powers. At this time, Inanna was not yet known as the goddess of sex, for she did not have any knowledge about the subject. It is then that she asks Utu to take her to the underworld so that she may eat the fruit of knowledge that grew from a tree there. Utu, ever supportive, aids her in this endeavor, reflecting the deep trust and understanding between them. Their descent into the underworld was not said to be faced with any challenges. Rather, Inanna simply eats the fruit and is filled with the knowledge she so sought. This story is thought to have influenced the tale of Adam and Eve, where Eve eats an apple from the Tree of Knowledge. Inanna prefers the farmer. In another short tale involving Inanna and her brother Utu, the divine twins are engaged in a playful conversation where the topic of Inanna getting married is brought up. It is revealed that a young farmer by the name of Enkimdu has been trying to court the goddess. However, the farmer's brother was a shepherd named Dumuzid, who also had been trying to court Inanna. While the rivalry between the two brothers festered, Inanna seemed to prefer Enkimdu. Utu, however, did not think the farmer was the better option. Rather, he believed Dumuzid to be the obvious choice. Utu and Dumuzid then began to slowly and gradually persuade Inanna into seeing that Dumuzid was the right choice, arguing that for every gift the farmer could give, the shepherd could give something even better. Enkimdu did not stand idly by, though, and also tried to convince Inanna that he could offer her more than his brother. This went on back and forth, until Inanna decided to marry Dumuzid. Their union was filled with celebration, but was marked with jealousy. Enkimdu, though initially upset at the situation, eventually reconciles with Dumuzid, settling their differences and offering each other gifts. This tale is believed to have influenced the story of Cain and Abel because both myths center around a farmer and shepherd competing for divine favor. Inanna and Enki As the story goes, one day Inanna descended to the depths of Enki's watery kingdom, where she is greeted by Isimud, Enki's attendant. Isimud, with a welcoming hospitality, invites Inanna in happily, offering her food and drinks during her stay. Inanna accepts the refreshments and asks to see Enki. The two make their way to Enki's throne room, where Enki is surprised to see the beautiful goddess. The two exchange pleasantries and enjoy each other's company with an assortment of food and drinks. However, little did Enki know, Inanna had an ulterior motive for her visit. Suddenly Inanna challenged Enki to a drinking competition, claiming that she could drink more than Enki in his old age. Enki, not one to back down from a challenge, agreed and requested Isimud to bring forth the drinks. The two began to drink, but Inanna had no intention on getting drunk. She took small sips and even pretended to drink, all while taunting Enki. When Enki was thoroughly intoxicated, Inanna began to persuade him to get her the mez, which were sacred artifacts belonging to the gods that allowed human civilization to exist. Each mez embodied in specific aspect of human culture, such as truth, victory, counsel, technology, writing, weaving, and social constructs such as law, kingship, and even prostitution. Whoever possessed the mez possessed the power over all aspects of civilization. As the night unfolded, Enki, basking in the warmth of hospitality and perhaps too much alcohol, agreed to bestow these precious gifts upon Inanna, Enki gave Inanna all the mez from the throne of kingship, all the way down to craft of woodworking, promising her the power to control all things. With the mez secured, Inanna hastily departed for the city of Uruk. But before she could leave, Enki called for Isimud to grant Inanna safe passage home by lending her the boat of heaven. And with that, 
Inanna was gone. Enki, having fallen asleep, eventually wakes up sober and notices that all the Mez had gone missing. In a panic, he called for Isimud to ask what happened while he was asleep. Isimud informed Enki that he had given all the Mez to Inanna. Realizing what had happened and angered by Inanna's deceit, Enki calls forth the fierce monsters and demons under his command to retrieve the Mez from Inanna before she returned to Uruk. As Inanna approached the gates to her city, she noticed the army of creatures following her. Ninshubur, her loyal attendant, emerged to defend the goddess. With Ninshubur's aid, all the creatures were defeated, and Inanna is given safe passage back into her palace, securing the Mez within her possession. With no return in sight, Enki called for Isimud once again to send the Uru giants after her and retrieve the Mez. The giants ventured to the gates of Uruk, challenging the goddess, and eventually surrounding her and Ninshubur. Without hesitation, Ninshubur sliced the air with her hands, and with a loud cry caused the giants to retreat and scatter. This repeated six more times, where Enki would send Isimud with an army to retrieve the Mez, only to fail each time. In the end, Enki relents and accepts that the Mez now belongs with Inanna. He spoke to her one last time, declaring that the Mez in her possession shall remain in the city of Uruk. In addition, the Boat of Heaven was now also under Inanna's command, for the Mez to control it was also given to her by Enki. With the Mez and the Boat of Heaven fully under her command, Inanna ascended from her role as a goddess into that of the Queen of Heaven and Earth showcasing her desire for never-ending conquest. Goddess of the Fearsome Divine Powers In this tale, Inanna, now the Queen of Heaven, traveled across the land, eventually stumbling upon a grand mountain. This was Mouth Ebi, and Inanna was infuriated by its glorious might and natural beauty. She shouted at the mountain, declaring that she would destroy it. She returns to the heavens and requests Anu, the God of the Heavens, to give her permission to destroy Mount Ebi. Anu, however, denies her request and warns her not to attack the mountain. Ignoring this direct command, Inanna proceeds to unleash her fury upon Mount Ebi, leaving no doubt about her might and the extent she will go to maintain cosmic balance and order. The story ends with Inanna explaining why she destroyed the mountain, showcasing her emotional decision-making and selfish nature. Inanna and Shukalatuda. The tale of Inanna and Shukalatuda explores darker themes of betrayal and vengeance. As the story goes, there once was a gardener named Shukalatuda, who was terrible at his job. All the plants he cared for died, all except for one poplar tree. Shukalatuda prayed to the gods for guidance in his work, hoping to stop being a failure of a gardener. To his surprise, Inanna is seen walking by as she decides to rest under the shade of the poplar tree. Shukalatuda quietly approached the goddess to see if she was awake. When he confirmed that she was asleep, he did the unthinkable. He removed the goddess's clothes and proceeded to have his way. When Inanna woke up from her nap and realized that she had been violated, she became furious. She was determined to bring the attacker to justice. In her fury, she unleashed a number of horrible plagues upon the earth, turning the very waters into blood. Shukalatuda realized that he was the reason behind Inanna's wrath and pleaded with his father for advice. His father told him to hide amongst the other people of the city, hoping to blend in with the rest of them. Inanna continued her search across the city but could not find Shukalatuda. She began to unleash a series of storms and closed all the roads to the city, hoping to isolate her attacker. However, she is still unsuccessful. Eventually, she calls out to Enki and requests his aid. Together, the two are finally able to locate Shukalatuda. The terrified gardener then proceeds to make up various excuses and justifications as to why he did what he did. Inanna, however, was not amused and killed him on the spot. This tale showcased Inanna's unyielding power her role as a custodian of justice, and her capacity to embody both the creative and destructive forces of the universe. Inanna and Gilgamesh In the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the oldest pieces of world literature, 
Inanna plays a pivotal role that intertwines with the fate of Gilgamesh, the legendary king of Uruk. As the story goes, as Gilgamesh and his companion Enkidu returned to the city of Uruk, they were approached by Inanna. Gilgamesh and Enkidu had just defeated the mighty ogre Humbaba, a feat that caught the goddess's attention. Inanna demanded that Gilgamesh become her husband, to which the hero declined. Gilgamesh pointed out that all of her past lovers have suffered in one way or another, and he refused to be another one of them. Angered by his refusal, Inanna ascends to the heavens to demand Anu to unleash the Bull of Heaven upon Uruk, causing widespread devastation as punishment. If he refused, Inanna threatened to unleash her wrath upon the world, breaking down the doors to hell and unleashing the dead upon the living. The Bull of Heaven, also known as Gugalana, was also the consort to her sister Erishkigal, the queen of the underworld. Anu eventually agrees to hand Gugalana over to Inanna. Inanna then sends the bull to attack the city, and most importantly Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Gugalana was a tough foe, but the combined efforts of Gilgamesh and Enkidu was too much for him to handle. The duo defeated Gugalana and offered its heart to Utu, the sun god. Inanna cursed Gilgamesh and Enkidu, to which Enkidu responds by throwing the thigh of Gugalana at Inanna's face and threatened the goddess with violence and death. The refusal of Gilgamesh and the subsequent death of Gugalana leads us to the most famous story involving Inanna. Inanna's Descent into the Underworld Inanna's journey into the underworld unfolds as she decides to attend Gugalana's funeral, a death inadvertently caused by her very actions. However, before she left her palace, Inanna instructed Ninshubur, her attendant, to seek aid from Enlil, Nana, Anu, and Enki to rescue her if she did not return after three days. The laws of the underworld dictate that, without explicit permission, those who entered may never leave. Adorned in her heavenly clothes, wearing the crown of heaven, draped in beads, a lapis lazuli necklace, donning her breastplate, her golden ring, and wielding her scepter, the symbol of her dominion, Inanna approached the underworld's gates with solemnity. As she approached the gates, Nedi the gatekeeper asked Inanna why she had come to the underworld. Inanna softly replied that she was there to attend the funeral of Gugalana. Nedi quickly informed Ereshkigal about Inanna's arrival. Ereshkigal was not happy to hear that her sister was at the gates, since she was the one that got her husband killed. In an act to both humiliate Inanna and strip her of her power. Ereshkigal instructed Nedi to make Inanna remove her clothes and artifacts at each of the seven gates before admitting her to the palace. With each gate she approached, Nedi would ask Inanna to leave one piece of clothing or artifact behind. Inanna questioned Nedi for the reason behind this, but each time Nedi simply responded with, It is just the ways of the underworld. By the time Inanna reached the throne room, she was naked, as she tried to approach Ereshkigal, rather than a warm welcome, she was met with her sister's fury. The Anuna of the Dead, a group of underworld judges, then surrounded her. Together, the Anuna of the Dead and Ereshkigal judged Inanna for her actions. They looked at her with a look of death. They spoke to her with a speech of anger. They shouted at her with a shout of heavy guilt. In the end, it was decided that Inanna was to be turned into a rotting corpse. Ereshkigal then proceeds to hang Inanna's corpse on the wall of her palace. After three days, Ninshubur approached Enlil, Nana, Anu, and Enki requesting for their aid. The first three gods all refused to help, stating that it was Inanna's fault for venturing into the underworld alone. Enki, however, showed a bit of compassion. The god of wisdom understood the situation clearly and sent two gallus, genderless demons, to the underworld. The Gala entered the underworld like flies, and followed Enki's specific instructions, attaching themselves closely to Ereshkigal. To their surprise, the queen of the underworld was in distress, and appeared to be going through a painful labor. The Gala sympathized with the Ereshkigal's pains, and she in gratitude offered them whatever gift they ask for, as long as they help her through this pain. As ordered by Enki, the Gala asked for the corpse that hung from the hook on the wall. Without thinking much of it, Erishkigal agreed to hand Inanna over to them. 
The Gala then revive Inanna with the food and water of life, and she rises from the dead. As Inanna proceeds to leave, she approached Neti and demanded the return of all her belongings. When Inanna returns to heaven, she is informed that she needs to find someone else to take her place on the wall, otherwise Ereshkigal would unleash her fury upon the world. It is then that the Gallus attempt to drag Ninshubur down to the underworld, but is promptly stopped by Inanna, insisting that Ninshubur should be spared since she was a loyal servant and had rightfully mourned for her during her time in the underworld. The Gallus then approached Shara, Inanna's beautician, who was still in mourning for Inanna. Again, Inanna insists that Shara should be spared as well. The third to be approached was Lulal, another servant of Inanna. He too had been mourning her disappearance and again was spared. It was then that the Gallus turned their attention to Dumuzid, Inanna's husband. Inanna immediately tried to interrupt, but was stopped by a sight that made her blood boil. While servants in her life mourned during her time in the underworld, her husband not only didn't mourn her, but was actively resting beneath a tree while being entertained by many women. Inanna decreed that Dumuzid should be dragged down to take her place on the wall. However, Dumuzid would not make this an easy task. He repeatedly evades capture by the Gallus, an effort in which he is aided by Utu, the sun god. Dumuzid goes into hiding for a period of time, until Inanna apparently has a change of heart. He is eventually located by Inanna, where she sentenced Dumuzid to hang on the wall in the underworld for six months of the year, and Geshtinana Inanna would hang on the wall for the other six months. During the time Geshtinana Inanna was in the underworld, Dumuzid would be allowed to stay in heaven with Inanna. This punishment is used to explain the different seasons we experience, especially regarding farming and agriculture where sowing and harvesting represent Dumuzid and Geshtinana. The two siblings would suffer for eternity while Inanna, who caused all the problems in the first place, was free to do as she pleased. The story of Inanna's descent is a complex tale with themes of loss, sacrifice, and rebirth. It explores the depths of sisterhood, revealing the rivalry that tied Ereshkigal and Inanna together. Through Inanna's revival and return to the upper world, the myth conveys a powerful message of resilience and the cyclical nature of life and existence. This story is also often considered to have influenced the tale of Persephone and Hades from Greek mythology. Inanna is often symbolized by the lion, the eight-pointed star, a rosette, and a dove, painting a vivid picture of her diverse nature and the vastness of her dominion. Each symbol not only represents a facet of her divine personality, but also communicates the breadth of her influence over the realms of war, governance, fertility, and peace. Emblematic of Inanna's ferocity and power in battle, the lion symbolizes her role as a warrior goddess, protector, and an entity not to be crossed. In artworks and seals, her association with this majestic beast speaks to her sovereign nature and her unyielding strength in the face of adversity. The Eight-Pointed Star This celestial symbol, representing Venus, ties Inanna directly to the heavens, highlighting her aspect as the morning and evening star. It encapsulates her beauty, her guidance for lovers and warriors, and her illumination of the dark corners of the human experience. The Rosette Often linked to fertility and the life-giving aspects of Inanna's divinity, the Rosette is a symbol of regeneration, growth, and the cyclical nature of life. This symbol ties her to the agricultural and natural cycles, emphasizing her nurturing aspects alongside her warrior persona. A symbol of peace and love, the dove contrasts Inanna's martial aspects. It represents her ability to bring about harmony and her role as a goddess of love and relationships, showing her softer nurturing side amidst her powerful presence. Together, these symbols form a complex portrait of Inanna, reflecting the multifaceted nature of her worship and the wide array of domains under her influence. They serve as a reminder of the complexity inherent in the divine and the ancient Mesopotamians' sophisticated understanding of their gods' natures. In the heart of ancient Mesopotamia, the worship of Inanna, the queen of heaven and earth, flourished. 
her devotees engaged in elaborate rituals, festivals, and prayers to honor her, seeking her favor and guidance in their lives. In cities like Uruk, her primary center of worship, towering ziggurats and grand temples rose toward the heavens, a testament to Inanna's revered status. These sacred spaces served as the nexus of divine and mortal realms. Priests and priestesses, dedicated to Inanna, maintained her temples with fervent devotion, performing daily rites to ensure her presence remained vibrant within the sanctuary walls. The inner sanctums housed statues of Inanna, often adorned with precious gems and metals, before which worshippers would lay their offerings of food, crafts, and votive objects, hoping to gain her blessings. Rituals dedicated to Inanna were rich and varied, reflecting her diverse domains. The sacred marriage ritual was among the most significant, symbolizing the union of Inanna with her consort, Dumuzid. This ceremony performed annually was not merely symbolic, but a communal event believed to ensure fertility for the land and people alike. The king, acting as Dumuzid, would partake in ceremonial marriage with a high priestess embodying Inanna, enacting a series of rituals that culminated in a holy marriage. This ritual ensured the divine blessings upon the kingdom, promising prosperity and abundance. Festivals in honor of Inanna were grand affairs that mobilized entire communities. The most notable was the celebration of the new year, Akitu, during which Inanna's triumphs were reenacted, her battles fought anew, and her descent into and return from the underworld dramatized. Processions filled the streets, with statues of Inanna carried aloft, surrounded by music, dancing, and the joyous chants of her followers. These festivals reinforced social bonds and reaffirmed the community's place under Inanna's protection. Prayers and hymns to Inanna were intimate communications between the deity and her worshippers, full of personal appeals for love, protection, and justice. They were recited in the privacy of homes, written on clay tablets, or sung in the temple courtyards. These prayers often praised Inanna's beauty, power, and generosity, while also imploring her aid in matters of the heart, disputes, and fertility challenges. Inanna's story portrays the divine as both creator and destroyer, lover and warrior, nurturer and bringer of change. Her stories navigate the complexities of life, embodying the polarities that define the world. Inanna, in her myriad of roles, serves as a mirror to the human condition, reflecting the intertwined cycles of life and death, joy and sorrow, growth and decline. Inanna's tales encourage us to explore the depths of our own natures and the universe's mysteries, inspiring a sense of wonder and reflection. Her enduring presence in modern consciousness is a testament to the power of mythology to connect us with our ancient past and guide us in navigating the complexities of the present. Her legacy is a beacon that continues to illuminate the path of human understanding, inviting us to delve deeper into the mysteries of the cosmos and our place within it. Thank you all for watching all the way to the end. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed making it. What did you think? Did I miss any details? Let me know in the comments below. If this is your first time watching one of my videos, then welcome to the channel. I hope I earned a like and subscription in your eyes. If not, that's okay. I'll keep making videos until I do earn it. If you're a returning viewer, thank you so much for your continued support. I truly appreciate all the views, likes, subscriptions, and kind words and messages. Without you, this channel wouldn't be here today. That's it for now. I hope to see you all in the next one.